Well, good morning. Uh, welcome. If you are making your way in, come on in and have a seat. Uh, those of you joining us at home, we're so glad that uh, you're joining us and we get to worship together in this way. Uh, we're going to start off this morning singing a song of praise, a shout of praise to the Lord. So if we could stand together, join us as we worship Jesus this morning. There's so many reasons to praise God for who he is, and uh, one that I just want us to just sit with this morning is the truth that God is sovereign, which means that he is in control over all things. Even when chaos surrounds, he is in control of all of it. In fact, my, my older son and I, have been, he's had this desire within this week, actually, I think from Baptism Sunday last week and listening to the invitation to read through the gospel of Mark. And so we've been reading through Mark together and uh, it's been neat that even the demons had to ask Jesus for permission for things. 
And we were sitting there in awe like, oh my gosh, God's authority is over all things. And there's nothing that happens without his hand and his awareness and his ability to make all things good for his glory and our good. And so this is who we worship this morning in every season. We can find a reason to praise him because he's worthy of it. And like I, like I said when we started, if, if there's one thing to set your heart on, maybe it's something different. Maybe there's a character trait of the Lord that he is pressing on your heart or reminding you of this week and worship him for that church. If you're looking for a reason this morning, I'm resting in his sovereignty, that he is in control and he holds us close and he cares for us so well. And he is reigning above all of these things. So as we continue to worship him and see his hand over your life, we're just in the middle of our stories, church. But God is the one who holds it all together, the beginning, even the middle, and of course the end. And he knows where it's all heading. And so it's in him we put our trust, and it's to him we continue to lift up this song of praise to. So join us as we continue to worship our sovereign God this morning. King. 
Jesus to reveal himself in your space, in your life, sovereign over all things, holding it all together. Your mercy now. 
one more time. God, what a privilege it is to sing of your goodness, to testify that you have been so good from the very beginning to now, and we know to the very end, that we can put our trust in who you say you are. And we thank you that you are all things that we need. You are every good thing. You are the one who sustains us. You hold us together. You hold it all together. And we can trust you with all of it. So this morning, God, as we confess these things, I thank you for your promise. Our good shepherd who gives us all that we need so we lack nothing. Who has goodness and mercy pursuing us all the days of our life. It is in your word that we put our trust and our hope, God. And we thank you for it. I pray this morning as we uh, come together here in this place with each other, God, that this would be a place where you would, through your people, God, through community, would you spur us on to encourage one another, to press on towards the, the goal that you have set before us, to be your witnesses everywhere you have us. I guess more than anything, God, I just want to hear your voice this morning, and I pray that we would be able to hear you. So, Father, speak to us here in this place. We long to be with you and meet with you this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with all of you here in the room. Welcome to those of you that are joining us online as well. And if you're new here, it's just so glad you're here. Hope you have a great experience today. Uh, today, we actually have some of our pastors and staff are out sick, some are traveling. And so to help host our services, I invited a friend. Would you give a warm welcome to Nathan up here? Yes. Thank you, Gina. I will be back up to teach in a few minutes, but take it away, Nathan. Thanks, Gina. Good morning, everyone. You can grab a seat for a moment. As Gina mentioned, my name's Nathan, and together with my family, we've been a part of Hope Church since the, actually the very first service that we had in the Park Center back those uh, years ago. And given that we have some team missing, we thought if you can't get to hear announcements from the regulars today, you might as well get to hear them in an Australian accent. So it's my privilege to share those today. Gina mentioned for those that are new here, if this is your first time, we're so glad to have you with us. And a couple of ways you can get to know a little bit more about Hope Community Church. In the seat pocket in front of you, you'll find one of these cards. You can scan the QR code on that, fill in a bit of information, or you can put your information on the card and hand that in. Sign up to our e-newsletter, find out a few things. Or there's people that'll be waiting in the lobby or in the back of the auditorium at the end of the service. You can just go up and introduce yourself and find more out about that. But one of the ways that we love to help people get to know each other is we take a couple of minutes during the service to give you the chance to meet a few people around you. Before we do that, we'll give you a, a question to help break the ice. It's a big week in Chicago this week. There's a few things going on. One of the really big things going on this week, though, is for a lot of our students, it's time to go back to school. Some have already gone back, but some are going back to school this week. And I don't know about you, when I was young and it was the end of summer, which in Australia is actually like the other half of the year, it's like after Christmas, but here, end of summer, and starting to get ready to go back to school, I was one of those kids that's like, oh, I'm ready, I'm looking forward, I want to see all my friends, I want to get back to school. Apparently that's weird, most people don't look forward to going back to school. So the question when you're saying hi to people this morning is, when, it came to, when you were a student, when it came to the end of summer, were you one of those ones who was looking forward to going back to school, or loathing the fact that summer vacation was over, but also... For those of you that have now gone past school and maybe you've got your own kids, has your opinion changed about that topic? So why don't you take a couple of minutes and say hello to people around you. Awesome. 
So just a couple of announcements to share before Gina comes up and, and shares with us today, and really just a couple of different ways that you can get involved in the life of hope and support and different things. The first one is we work with an organisation that serves women who have been impacted by human trafficking. We're actually looking for volunteers that, that can support that, one in prayer, but there's actually some ways you can get involved and support that directly. To learn more about that, go onto the website, there's some information directly that just explains some of the different ways that you can get involved in helping support that. But also practically for everyone, over the next two Sundays, we're going to be creating gift bags for the women that have, have been um, involved in that. And the, the things that we can bring in to help build those gift bags, if, if uh, things like small soaps and shampoos, nail polish, tea bags, if you travel for work, whether you get like the little amenity kits on aeroplanes or even the things that you get in hotel rooms, if you've got any of those that you have just stored in a cupboard that are unused, perfect, bring those in as well. So over the next two Sundays, we'll be collecting those things to put those gift bags together. And that's something everyone can be a part of. So uh, keep that in mind. And then another area is, I'm sure we all appreciate our parking team and our security team that support week in, week out, making the best of some of the, yeah, give them a hand. <laughs> Making the best of some of the challenges that it is. Last week was Baptism Sunday. We had so many people here and it was such an amazing time, but that does create challenges in the parking lot. We're looking for people that can help support that. If you are able to help either in support the parking or in our security team, um, we would be very grateful for that support. And you can, a couple of ways, again, sign up online or you can speak directly to Do Kim or Jason Young and they would love to get you involved. If you came prepared to give today, there is a giving box in the back just by the, the, the door there, or you can give online. But for our last uh, announcement this morning, I'm going to welcome a couple of friends. If Alex and Matt want to come up, you can give them a hand as they're coming. So Alex and Matt coordinate our 20s to 30s program, and they're going to share a little bit of information about an event that's coming up next Sunday. But before they do, I'd love you guys just to introduce yourself a little bit, tell us your name, how long you've been here at Hope, and maybe something interesting about yourself that we don't know. Hi, I'm Matt. i am uh, been going with my family to Hope since the uh, Park District days as well. Uh, I fence in my free time, and I'm a coach as well. Hello, I'm Alex. I'm not as cool, I'm not a fencer, but um, I am a mental health counseling student at Trinity International University, and I'm also a math tutor in my uh, free time to make some money, so if you need a math tutor, I got you. <laughs> there you go, if you need help with math or fencing. I think this is the first time I've ever met a fencer in real life, so exciting Sunday for me. Hey, why don't you tell us about the event that's coming up next Sunday? Sure, so uh, next Sunday we're having the 20s and 30s meet up for some free food, some sandwiches, and pickleball, volleyball, and basketball. So if you are 20 to 39, please come over. We'd love to see you. <laughs> yeah, if you have any questions, we'll be in the back after service uh, about the event or about our group in general. So, Thank you, 20 to 39. I love the specificity there. <laughs> it rules me out. It's a good range. Um, but while we have Alex and Matt up here, we thought we also have the opportunity to share today's scripture, so I'll let you guys read that out. All right. So Romans 12, 9, 16. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another, uh, another above all yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual favor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Can we thank Matt and Alex? And also, can we welcome up Gina as she comes to share? Way to go. And I agree. Announcements are better with an Australian accent. So thank you, Nathan. It was awesome. Yes, you can, you can clap for him too. Thank you. 
Oh, it is so good to be with you this Sunday morning. One of the things that I love about our church is every week there's new people that walk into our doors for the very first time. And two weeks ago, there was a family that came in. And it was kind of an interesting story. They came to find me after the service, and they said basically they came with their son, who's about 10 years old, and uh, he had started to do some searching online. They really hadn't been in church for a while, and, and he started to get really curious about Christianity, and he said, is there a church we can go to? And so his parents started asking around, and there was a family here who invited them to Hope. And, and so they showed up, and so this boy walks through the doors, and he looks around, and he's like, this is a church? He's like, did anybody tell them that this looks like a gym inside? Like, he was really confused. And, and so he comes up at the end, and, you know, his mom's explaining, like, yeah, this just wasn't what he was expecting when he thought of a church. And, and so I start to talk with the boy, and I was like, you know, the church is really about the people. It's not the building. And he started again, look skeptical. I think what he had in mind was something uh, like this picture of a church. I think that's what he thought he was going to be walking into. And, uh, you know, I started to share with him. I'm like, no. Oh, you know, actually in the early church, people would gather in homes and it wasn't about the place. It was about this group of people gathering together to worship. And he still looked at me a little side-eyed and was kind of like, oh, okay, I'm not sure if I believe you, but he was like, I'll be back. And so I was like, all right, I'll take it, you know. But it got me thinking about the church. So that was two weeks ago. And then last week, uh, it was Baptism Sunday. And 36 people were baptized here, declared in front of this community that they want to follow Jesus. They're committing their lives to Christ. And if you've heard us talk about baptism, you know we've said that it is not the finish line. That you don't get baptized when you've gotten it all right, when you have read the entire Bible, when you've stopped sinning. No, uh, baptism is the beginning. It's the starting point. But if baptism's the starting point then what's the finish line look like? And today we're going to dive into a passage that Paul writes, that, that Matt and Alex read for us. And it's this passage from Romans 12. And the thing I love about this passage is uh, Romans, it's kind of an interesting book. The first part of Romans, it's all like a theological book. There's a lot of Christian doctrine, like who is God and, and what's he about and, and who is Jesus? What's he like? Why did he come? And that's the first 11 chapters. But then Paul turns it and he gets really, really practical. And he begins to dive into the Christian life. And you may know people who claim to have a faith, who maybe were baptized, who declare that they believe in Jesus, that, that maybe even come to church, and yet they're the same irritable, difficult people they've always been. Maybe you're related to someone like that. Maybe if you're honest, that person stares at you in the mirror every morning, right? There are sometimes people that we know, even ourselves, we can see it like we, we believe in God, we know him, but it doesn't always translate. And Paul has this passage here, and as I was talking to this young boy about the church and what the church is supposed to be like, I was thinking about this idea of, of stained glass, like what he must have had in his mind when he imagined the church. And I thought, oh, gosh, this is something I want us to talk about. It ties directly to this passage in Romans. And before you get nervous and think that this is going to be a fundraising pitch to put in stained glass windows, I assure you it's not. We're going to come back to that idea. But it did get me thinking about what the people of the church are supposed to be like. And here in this book of Romans, Paul lays it out. And uh, if you've ever been to a fireworks show, you know, sometimes like fireworks shows, they start out kind of slow, like there's a firework here and there, and it lingers. But then at the end of the show, it's like boom, 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 right? They come at you all at once. And that's almost like what Paul is laying out here. He's saying, if you want to know what the Christian life is, now that I've gone through all the doctrine, all the theology, if you want to know what this looks like in practical terms, here it is. And he starts hitting us, boom, boom, boom. And we don't have time to get to every single one, but I am going to highlight a few of those today for us to look at. For those of us who claim to follow Jesus, who call ourselves Christians, who've maybe been baptized and decided for ourselves, yep, we're going to follow him. What does this love, life look like? First one comes out of Romans chapter 12, verse 9. It says this, love must be sincere. 
It's the idea of loving without pretending. You see, a lot of times in churches, especially, we can find that people are nice on the outside, but it doesn't always align with what's going on underneath. And Paul's saying, actually, no, the Christian community, there's not supposed to be any fakeness. This is supposed to be a sincere, authentic community where people take off the masks, where there's no veneer, where what you see is what you get. In fact, in Scripture, we see one of the most distinct opposite examples of this in the way Judas treated Jesus. He betrays Jesus with a kiss. What's on the outside, not the same as what's on the inside. But the thing is, I think oftentimes we know what behavior is kind of expected of us. Like we know what we're supposed to look like on the outside, how we're supposed to appear and act. And sometimes even without thinking, like we can kind of put on a second face. We can kind of be two-faced. And maybe not accurately really show up the way we are authentically. And I think one of the places I see this happen the most is in job interviews. I remember when I was first interviewing for my real, first real job, I graduated from college. I majored in information technology. And uh, I was looking for tech jobs in basically any industry. And so I had interviews in finance and insurance. And like I knew nothing about finance or insurance, but I was like, okay, I need a job, you know? And I'd go to these interviews. And, you know, I didn't know a lot about those industries, but I knew that, okay, if it's technology, there's probably some projects, there's probably some deadlines, some tasks. And, Inevitably, you get to the question in the interview and they'd say, oh, what are you most excited about with this job opportunity? And I would say, with all the energy I could muster up, I'd say, oh, I can't wait to see a project start and then finish. Like, oh my gosh, it'd be a dream come true to see a project go from inception to completion. And I think they bought it. Somebody finally hired me. But I couldn't tell him what I was really looking forward to was my first real paycheck. Like, that didn't seem like an okay answer. Like, I knew, like, hey, if I'm going to get this job, I better come up with something. And I think often for us, we know what's socially correct. We know what's expected of us. We know how we should show up. And it sometimes is out of alignment with who we really are. And Jesus is saying, my people show up real, authentic, sincere. They don't pretend. So what does that mean? If someone rubs you the wrong way, you can just tell them off? No. But it does mean that in sincere Christian community, when someone's done something that's bothering you, it's not okay to just let it go. Just brush it under the rug that there is a time where you need to address the issue and, just, and stop pretending. How are you doing with this one? How are you doing with loving people sincerely without pretending? When someone does rub you the wrong way, do you ask God to maybe soften your heart to help you understand them? When there's an issue with someone, do you just try to brush it off, ignore it, or do you have the courage to address it? Paul here is telling us if we're going to be a part of a real Christian community, if we're going to show up as followers of Christ, we love without pretending. And then he continues on, and right after saying love must be sincere, he says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. The idea? Be discerning. And when you think about this, it's kind of strange that Paul goes right from love must be sincere to hate what is evil. But the truth is to really love someone, you can't gloss over evil. When someone you care about is involved in something dangerous or wrong or just plain evil, it's not loving to just let that go and be quiet. It requires something. Now, a lot of times we don't like to talk about evil. It doesn't feel good, but, but evil is real. We see it throughout scripture. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus actually names some of the evil things inside us. And he says, watch out for these things. He says, watch out for things like lust and envy and greed and arrogance and deceit. Hate those things. The idea is to hate the things that Jesus hates. And, and when you read through the scripture and you look at what Jesus spoke often against, it was about religious leaders, religious people who said one thing, who demanded things of other people, but didn't live that life themselves. 
how are you doing with this one? It's one that says, cling to what's good. Stay away from evil. Are you dabbling, dipping your toe in something you know that's destructive? This is saying, hey, run as fast and as far away as you can. Hold on to what's good. Find people who can support you if you have to. Hate what's evil. Cling to what's good. And then Paul continues. Honor one another above yourselves. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. The idea here is the idea to spotlight other people. This is all about how we treat other people, how we relate to them, and how we view ourselves in light of them. If I had to sum it up in one word, it's the word humility. It's, it's how we treat other people, how we think about them. R.C. Sproul, who's a pastor and an author, he said this about the, the kingdom of God. In the kingdom, there is no room for the politics of envy. That there's not to be envy and jealousy amongst us, but actually we're to look at other people, honor them, spotlight them, celebrate them, be aware of their needs, their hopes, their fears, their worries. Back in the, the 19th century, there were two guys that were running to be the prime minister of the United Kingdom. Their names were William Gladstone and Benjamin Disraeli. And uh, they were both pretty brilliant guys, but people thought William Gladstone was just incredible. I mean, he was charming, he was witty, he was just brilliant. Seemed to know everything about everything. And Winston Churchill's mother, her name was Jenny, she actually had a chance to sit down for dinner with both of them. And after she had dinner with them, here's what she said. She said, when I left the dining room after sitting next to Mr. Gladstone, I thought he was the cleverest man in England. And then she said, but after sitting next to Mr. Disraeli, I thought I was the cleverest woman. See the idea there? When people sit with you, when they spend time with you, do they walk away thinking, man, oh, she's so smart. He's so talented. Wow, she's really impressive. Or do they walk away from the conversation thinking, wow, that was, a, that was a great conversation. I'm not so bad myself. The idea of living this way is being a person who highlights, spotlights other people, sees their strengths, calls them out, honors them. That's the idea of what we're called to be like in conversations and in community in the church. Paul continues on. He says, practice hospitality. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. This one's one of my favorites. In short, it's be there for people. It, it's kind of related to the, the last one. It's the idea of standing with people, seeing their needs. But there's this word in there that says hospitality. We're to practice hospitality. This idea of helping people feel at home. And when you think about what you do when you're at home, you grieve the losses of your favorite sports teams with your family. You celebrate things like the first day of school and birthdays together. You make people feel seen and cared for. That's what a healthy family does. And that's what Paul's describing here. When I was in college, I saw part of this lived out, this idea of mourning with those who mourn. A friend of mine, his father passed away, and a bunch of us were going to go to the funeral. Now, the funeral was going to be in Michigan, and so we'd have to drive a few hours to get there. And uh, we had another friend who said, hey, I really want to come, but i got to move some things around. And he was in school a few hours away, so he said, i got to move an exam that i got to take, and if you guys could wait with me, I really want to come. And so we said, okay, we'll wait for you. And, and he got there after moving an exam around, driving a few hours, and, and then we had to basically drive through the night to get to this funeral. And I said to him, I was like, I mean, this is pretty inconvenient. Like, why'd you come? Why don't you just sit this one out? And he said oh, I'll never miss a funeral. Sounded like a strange thing from a college student. I said, what do you mean? And he said, look, you never forget the people that show up for you when times are hard. And he's like, you also never forget the people who you thought were going to be there and weren't. 
And he was really uh, mature for his years because what I'll tell you is years later, after talking with people that have faced so much grief, they echo a similar sentiment. They say, you won't believe the people that showed up for me who were there when I needed them. And one of the biggest hurts was the people they thought would be there but weren't in a church community, in a community that claims to follow Jesus, what Paul is telling us that we are to be people that mourn with those who mourn, that we show up for each other. And oftentimes we'll make excuses and say, oh, well, they need their space. But a lot of times it's about our own discomfort. And I want to encourage us to get past that, to show up, to be there, to not miss the funeral, to sit with the person, to just be present, be there. It says, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice. This past week, I watched a group of people at our church throw an 80th birthday party for a woman who had never had a birthday party in her life. And as I watched this group of people come together to celebrate this woman, I looked around, I just stood back and I thought, oh, I hope this is always true of our church. I hope we're always looking for excuses, reasons to celebrate each other. That's the community. How are you doing at this showing up for people in good times and bad times, laughing with them and crying with them? Are you the kind of person that's going to throw the party for your friend when they get the promotion, show up for them when they didn't get the job? Are you that kind of follower of Jesus? And then Paul says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Idea? Pray continually. Always be praying. Thing is, life has its ups and downs. We know it. It's not a straight, smooth road. And here, Paul gives us, in just a few words, a little bit of roadmap of how to navigate it. He says, you can always be joyful in hope. We have the hope of Jesus in eternity. We have the hope of his peace no matter what we're facing. We can be patient in difficult times. We can hold on. And the way to do it, he says, faithful in prayer. To keep an ongoing conversation with God. If you're frustrated, tell him. If you are just at the end of your rope, tell him. If you need a breath, tell him. If you need an attitude adjustment, tell him. It's the idea that there's not a spiritual life and the rest of your life. It's that we're in an ongoing relationship with God, opening ourselves up to him, telling him what's on our mind. This ongoing communication, that's what allows us to be joyful in hope, to be patient when times are trouble. It's the idea of being faithful in prayer. If you're in the middle of something hard right now, how's that conversation going? Do you find yourself opening up to him, talking to him? Oh, Paul here lays out these quick, short bursts to the description of what Christian community is supposed to be like, what people who follow Jesus are supposed to look like. And as I was thinking about this and the beauty of what God does in us as we follow after him, as he does this kind of work in us to transform us into these kinds of people, it brought me back to that question of that little boy who said, this this really, this is a church? Uh, less, several years ago, our family had a chance to travel to Paris. And uh, we had looked forward to this trip for years. We had like researched a ton. We wanted to see the Eiffel Tower. We wanted to eat French food. We wanted to see Notre Dame, this incredible cathedral. And, and wouldn't you know it, a few weeks before we were supposed to leave, there was a fire at that cathedral. And so they shut it down and we couldn't go into it. And so I quickly did start doing some research, and I thought, you know, I want to see one of these old churches. I want to, I want to visit one of those, and uh, stumbled across this old church called St. Chapelle. It's the picture that you saw earlier, and we walked into this church, and it was like the most incredible kaleidoscope you've ever seen. Panels of stained glass windows, floor to ceiling, over 1,100 pictures, scenes from the Bible, from the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you zoomed in, you could see pictures of Jesus getting the crown of thorns on his head. We've got an example of it here. This was one of the images. But as you looked across this, this whole landscape, you could see all of Scripture, and it was breathtaking. I, like, I walked in there, and I was awestruck, and I thought to myself, like, yeah, why don't we build churches like this? 
And I started to do some research into this chapel because I, I just, I'd never even heard of it. And I, as I researched it, well, there was this king of France, King Louis IX, and, and in the 13th century, he acquired the crown of thorns and a piece of the cross. And he said at that time, I want to build a structure that's worthy of these relics. And so he built St. Chapelle. And then he worshipped there. Because there's this idea that, gosh, when you're around these beautiful images, it just moves you to worship. And I began to research some more like, when did stained glass begin to be like a part of architecture and churches? And it turns out during this time, during, during this medieval period in Europe's history, basically most of the population was illiterate and couldn't read the language that the Bible was in at that time. It was in Latin. And so when they would come to church on Sunday, the people relied on a priest to translate the scripture into a language they could understand. But when you worship in a place like this, not knowing the language wasn't a barrier anymore because you could see the story of God on display. So even if you couldn't read the words, you felt the magnificence of what God had done. You could read and see the pictures of his story all throughout those walls. Thought back to that question. Why not in our churches today? But then... So I was studying the book of Romans and this picture of the church, of what the beauty of the church is supposed to look like. I thought to myself, imagine that instead of the beauty of God's word displayed in the architecture of the church, what if it was on display in our lives? Instead of people reading the story of God in pictures on a wall, what if they could see the stories of transformation in our own lives? Imagine that. The issue back then was that the Bible wasn't translated into a language that the people could understand. I wonder what it would look like today if the words of this Bible that we could all read and understand were translated into the way that we live our lives. Stained glass, it's beautiful. But there is nothing more striking than the beauty of this kind of a community lived out in real time with real people. Imagine if the beauty of the church wasn't in stained glass, but in a group of people that were those things we talked about before, people who loved without pretending, people who showed up real and sincere without masks, people who knew what was good and right and pursued it, people who spotlighted others where this is a church that doesn't just platform a few people, but where we celebrate and honor the gifts of every single person building this church? What if we were a group of people that were there for each other, laughed together, cried together, there for each other, good times and bad, a group of people that opened ourselves for the work of God in us, praying continually in an ongoing conversation with God, not that we can do it on our own, but that he can speak to us and through us. Imagine the striking beauty of that kind of a church. Now, all the tour guides, all the books will tell you, if you want to see the beauty of St. Chapelle, make sure you go on a sunny day. Because when that sunlight shines through those glass panes, your breath will be taken away. Maybe you know where I'm going with this. But imagine if the light of the sun was on display in our lives, in our homes, in our jobs, in our communities. People wouldn't have to come to a church building because these panes of stained glass would walk into their neighborhoods, walk into their stores, walk into their homes. That's the community that Paul describes in the book of Romans. One last verse I want to highlight. See, over time, this chapel uh, fell into disrepair. Over time, um, during the French Revolution, it was vandalized. Eventually, it became a place that actually stored grain. And then, eventually, it became filled with file cabinets, filled with legal documents. The file cabinets stretched so high that it covered the stained glass until someone fought for it to be repaired later on. But for some of you, I wonder if your faith has maybe gotten a little dusty, maybe fallen into disrepair a little bit. The one time you had a faith that was vibrant, that was alive in you, but taken a step back, 
last verse in Romans I want us to look at is Romans 12, 11 that says this, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. If you have stepped back a little bit, if you've fallen away a little bit, maybe it's time to renovate. Maybe this week you can open up the scripture again, turn it to Romans 12, just read through it, invite God to speak to you. Maybe you can open up that conversation up again with him. Maybe there was that area you thought you might serve in. Maybe now's the time to follow up. The idea of this verse is this is a faith where we go all in. We go all in. In a few minutes, um, we're going to take communion together. And if you didn't get the elements on your way in, just raise your hand, and we have some volunteers that will that'll pass them out to you. But when I look at these words that Paul wrote, they echo some of the words that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and the truth is, these are difficult words to live. We cannot do it on our own. We need the transforming work of God, his spirit working through us. But what I can promise you is this. God will never ask us to forgive more than he has forgiven us. He will never ask us to be more patient than he is with us. And he will never ask us to love more than he has loved us. 1 John 4 says it this way, we love because he first loved us. And out of his love for us, he thought we were worth sacrificing his life. And he went first. He demonstrated his love for us, knowing that we could not earn our way to him. He lived the perfect life, went to the cross, died a horrific death, and rose again. And because of that, we can always have hope. And we have available to us the transforming work of his spirit. And so in a moment, we're going to take the elements together. But I just want to give you a, a few moments of silence. A time for you just to say to God whatever is on your heart and mind. And uh, maybe you came here and you're struggling with something. I'd encourage you, open your heart up. Open up the conversation. Tell them about it. Uh, maybe your faith has gotten a little dusty. And, and this is a time to invite him back into your life. Or maybe... Just take a moment to say a simple word of thanks to this God who went first to show you that he loves you. So take a couple moments and then we'll come back together. You can go ahead and open up the top part with the bread. Out of his love for us, Jesus allowed his body to be broken for us. Let's eat this bread and remember him. You can peel back the cup. In the same way, Jesus allowed his blood to be spilled for us. Let's drink and remember and thank him. Will you pray with me? Oh, Jesus, thank you so much for loving us enough to suffer for us, for going to the cross on our behalf. God, thank you. God, I feel like the words are never enough. And so um, just from the bottom of our hearts, God, just express our gratitude to you. God, I pray um, that you would work in our hearts to transform us. God, we invite you in. God, would you shape us as people and as a community to be people who love well, who know what's right, who cling to what's good. Help us to be people who are humble, honoring others above ourselves. God, I pray that we would be the kind of people that show up for each other, that celebrate and mourn together. And God, I pray that we would be a people of prayer. Not doing this life on our own, but inviting you in into every part of it, God. Would you have your way in us and in your church? And God, by your power, would you tell your story in each of us and through this entire church community? God, we love you. God, would you have your way in us? 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close out our service, that we'd sing one last song together. So would you stand to your feet? Let's sing. Be So good to worship with you today, church. If there's anything we can do to serve you, we'd love to know about it. Come down front, say hello, or visit with one of our volunteers in the lobby. But hope you have a fantastic week, and we'll see you next Sunday, everyone.